we will certainly validate what we heard, and that's why we're taping it. And ultimately, the information that results from this meeting um, will in some fashion be posted on our website with our responses to continue the dialogue. This is the beginning of a dialogue, not the end of a dialogue. So, that said. All right. Um, I'm Jordan Auslander. Um, I was looking at the inventory um, of what records are going to remain, what we're going to lose, what will be donated, and of course that raises questions as donated to whom. Um, and I realized that I've been just dealing with the tip of the iceberg. My God, you, you folks have the investigation of the torpedo bombers that disappeared over the Bermuda Triangle. You have an incredible, I, this has always been an incredible resource. I've been using it as a professional, uh, sometimes as a scholar. And I feel that this move will become a great shop front at the expense of the stockroom. Uh, I realize a lot of uh, the resources are off-site already and that there is, we're going to be, uh, as I understand from Roger Joslin's uh, letter, that the storage space, while being much improved in terms of humidity, preservation and the like, is going from approximately 20,000 square feet to 5,000 square feet. Um, certain things will be, we'll be able to get um, naturalization certified the same day and all that. But it's, it's sort of analogous to what the Museum of the American Indian, uh, when they moved from 155th Street here. They could only show a, a small fraction uh, of their, their holdings, and now here it's, it's sort of reversed. What we're trading from, it, it's, it's their trade-offs in every move. We got accessibility here when you move from Bayonne. I mean, a, a quantum leap in accessibility. Um, this location is terrific. The, I'm a big fan of Cass Gilbert and his architecture. It's a showcase. Um, we're at a spot close to where about 80% of the immigrants to the United States first set foot. But, again, um, and I understand the economic realities. I mean, McKeldon Smith can, can tell you the heartbreak that they went through, uh, the New York Biograph Genealogical and Biographical Society. We need to explore alternatives to keep what can't be fit here in a secure facility within a day's range. Brooklyn, Stapleton, um, there are many, I'm sure there are many options, even potentially the World Trade Center site eventually. Um, you can't have just a glitzy shop front and, nothing, and, and everything's gonna be on back order. Um, there are certain things, I, I understand that there's, there's a, an amount of triage um, I will need to get uh, documents certified the same day. But then, you know, looking at, at what's available here, my God, you, you could you save people a trip to Washington, to Pittsfield, to Waltham, to Philadelphia. New York deserves a world-class facility. And I, I think every effort should be made to make sure that this facility, while looking great, also has the, the capability to service uh, every variety of user who would come in here. You're going to bring in so many new people because of your proximity to Ellis Island. I see a lot of cross-pollination opportunities. There's a synergy with the other facilities. You're walking distance now from the municipal archives. We go back and forth. The municipal archives does not have internet access, so that's going to be uh, a boon for most researchers. Anyway, those are my primary concerns. I'm sure they'll be addressed within the next 18 months, but please, don't, I mean, we gain from Kansas to Philly, but we've got to make the jump from Philly to, you know, the commuting distance of this, of this area. And I'll hand this off to the next person. Any staff want to respond? Well, I, 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 I mean, we, we've heard that many times. Um, and we did look very carefully uh, around the region to try and identify a uh, off-site storage location. Um, the, w we believe that we can address all of your concerns um, through this, 
collaboration with the Mid-Atlantic region, which is why V is here. The staff of the two entities have been talking together um, for almost a year now, uh, developing protocols for how we're going to meet the research needs of all the people who come to the Var to now come to Varick Street and will be coming to the Customs House. We hear you. We're going to continue working on that. That is one of our highest priorities. And I'm, I may have misheard, but I think you said 5,000 square feet here. What I understood is that the, the storage facility, the onsite storage is going from 20,000 to about 5,000 square feet. Is that? Actually, no. The square footage is, is much larger than, than 5,000 square feet. I don't know what the exact square footage is, Dave. Yeah, I think uh, there's been a lot of misinformation as far as uh, what's out there is to bring approximately 5,300 cubic feet of records here, which would obviously be stored in a much larger square footage area. The other thing, I, I've seen this, and I, it's in our uh, FAQs, that the public space for everybody in this room will be significantly larger here than anything we have at Varick Street. More public access computers, more public space, more research space, so, you know, just to be able to try to clarify some of the um, items that are out there, and I know people don't always spend time, you know, checking all the FAQs, that's why these meetings are so important, but uh, from a public standpoint, the space will be significantly better here than, it w than we have at Varick Street, even with the improvements that were done at Varick Street a few years ago. Well, and if, if I could um, just add to that. I'm also going by your own tentative uh, assessment of what records would be retained and what would be um, the accession, if you will. Um, and then there's the additional question of there's certain things to be donated and, you know, to whom are you considering donating? I'm sure that's an ongoing process. I'd like to be kept informed of that. I think it's important that, that records or original textual records we're not donating or deaccessioning any textual records. I think you're referring to microfilm publications, which is different. So I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. No original records are going to be donated to anyone or deaccessioned. Where the microfilm, though, we are looking at a, a, a wide range of options. Uh, Leslie Korn. Um, a major concern that I have is that the National Archives will drive its decision about records to keep based on what commercial companies are doing. I would hate to see that happen. Um, if you're going to rely on internet access to records that Ancestry provides or Footnote provides, um, that is a concern. Um, if the staff has based its list, its primary, I mean its, its initial list, on how they're serving the public, that doesn't take into account those of us who are regulars who know our way around and don't have to ask, mm -hmm. and the staff doesn't know. Um, what I would like to propose is that those of us who are regulars and anyone else who wants to contribute um, recommends records that we want to have kept here and put together a list for you. And that's definitely why we're doing this, is we want to hear from the widest cross users of what you think we should keep. Again, that's why it was a preliminary list developed by staff. It's very preliminary. I'm, I'm talking about a, a big list that's not, that we shoot off, you know, individual people. Yes, but that we actually compile. Okay. So, uh, we're going to go to Dan. I spoke to Diane about this uh, when I called to RSVP. I have a couple of concerns. As far as storage, uh, and people from the Navy Yard, they may not know anyone here how big that Navy Yard is. I do. I grew up down there. My parents lived on Ashland and Myrtle Avenue. That Navy Yard is huge. <laughs> huge. It goes all the way. So why not find some room there for storage? <laughs> Partnership? Uh, as I said, it is huge. It built ships during World War II. It is huge. There has to be some place there for storage. That's concern number one. Concern number two, being a New Yorker, I needed something. I did get it from off-site. I came in, I requested it, but I'm a New Yorker. 
They tell me when to be ready. I had to rearrange my schedule, take off a day from work, but that wasn't a main problem. And, you know, come in and do it. But I'm a New Yorker. A lot of people coming in aren't New Yorkers. And they may not know what's here and what they can get, and you have to request it. It has to come in. Did it take long? I honestly don't remember. Did I get everything I requested? Absolutely, yes. That's two. Three, you're near Ellis Island. Ellis Island's website is not user-friendly. If anyone is here from Ellis, you're not user-friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Morse is user-friendly, extremely user-friendly. You need an email and, a and, <laughs> and an ID number, and then a PIN number so you can get in and use it. So it's not exactly open to, because if you, I have an email, which I hate and I never read, so I don't give out the email address. But that's what Stephen Morse. You are so close to Ellis. People are gonna wanna come in and get the records. I couldn't find my records on Stephen Morse. I couldn't find them on Ellis either. They came in through the United States. Ancestry did not have it. It was thanks to Carol Salvo and thanks to Joni Young that I was able to find my family on the microfilm coming into the country. When I hit a snag, Stewie, who is a volunteer and people who work know Stewie, Gail, go back to the microfilm. Go and look it up. That is what you need to take. You need to take the manifests the microfilm manifests. There is nothing like it. And as far as the 42nd Street Library goes, yes, they do have the manifest. But they're not user friendly. And the machines for copying them are from hunger. I know, I've done it. You have to do half, and then you have to do the other half. Horrible. Narrow machines are much better. You do it all in one fell swoop. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. It's wonderful. And there is nothing in this world like the thrill of seeing the original <coughs> manifest. That's one of my things that you must take with you. The other thing, that's the microfilm, the indexes, and everything that goes with it, as well as all naturalization. Because if people are coming to New York and they need to get a passport, they need their naturalization and they need it certified. Mm -hmm. And if I think of anything else, I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, we're gonna go to Elliot. In the two years that I've been a volunteer, I've come to recognize three types of individuals relative to this issue. There are, of course, the professionals, the genealogists, the scholars, who know all about the archives. The terminology I've heard here, uh, much of it I don't even recognize. That's not quite true. Second type of individual, people who are seeking their own personal genealogical history. They've taken the time and trouble to find the archives, to locate the archives, go through security on Varick Street. And the third type of individual, who not only don't know where the archives are, don't even know what the archives are. As a volunteer, I've told so many people I'm, I'm volunteering at the National Archives, and they've said, oh, what's that? The location here will have a tremendous impact on those people who happen to clue that the government has a national archives. It will allow people who walk through the door to see the uh, Museum of, of the Indians to learn, oh, oh, there's a national archives. That's, for me, a tremendous reason for the move to this location, a very important reason, to make the public know of this important work that is being done. That's what I think. Estelle had made a, a great suggestion that uh, publish possibly, maybe online, a list of what your holdings are. There's a lot of stuff there that people don't know that you have. I, apparently, we we're just learning this as we compiled this list. All the microfilm publications are online, on order online, and you can search by location. So you can say, New York City, what microfilm you have, and see a complete list, just as an FYI. But we are going to be putting this online to get this kind of feedback so you can see both the microfilm publication and the original records that we have. Absolutely. 
could at least indicate on the online uh, uh, lists which were the ones that you're currently thinking about taking and which you are not. Uh, the kind of things that's in this book, I think this would be very helpful. What you're, what the book, and, and the book is available at our facility. Here's a copy. This is the binder that has the draft list. We are eventually going to make this available, and it will clearly indicate what's our preliminary come with us, what's our preliminary off-site, so we can get this kind of feedback. It's hard to give it to you in one sitting. So of course, of so course. I think copies of this list, if it could be made available to the attendees, because I think these are people who are concerned that they turned out, and, and, and you'll get feedback from them. And I, 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 I hate to see the archive turn from a, you know, a, a serious um, research facility into just a, uh, you know, let's get the public, um, you know, the, the, the folks who come from Ellis Island and, and then we'll stop by here. I think that's nice. It'll probably increase your universe at some point. But I think there is a lot of stuff in here that's, that's uh, you know, a serious researcher would, would be interested in looking at. and. The turnaround time, I know there are, there are facilities in New York uh, that have off-site storage for some things, and, and you have to request it a week in advance, and you don't know that you have to request it a week in advance until you get there, or whatever the time frame is that they send somebody out to their off-site facility. So I think, yeah, you've got a year, you said you have a year and a half before the move takes place. I would hope that part of that time you spend looking for some off-site facility, it's possible you know, that stuff like the Weather Bureau's records are something that you can ship far away and no one will ever ask for them, <laughs> except somebody from the Weather Bureau. But, uh, but for some of the other things, uh, uh, having them nearby at least, even if you can't have them all physically in this building, although I wish you could, um, but, if, if, but at least if they were within 24 hours access, so that if you did have somebody coming from out of town that just happened to you know, learn about the archive and come here and then discover that what they really wanted to see is not available, won't miss it just because, you know, they picked the wrong day. Or yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to take off, uh, continue what, uh, what Estelle was pointing out. And, uh, and I, I just want to point out that uh, in, in, uh, we, we live in a modern era when um, it potentially could be as easy to get something um, as, as we do now, we request something, someone goes into the back room and comes out with a copy of it. Well, if that back room is in northeastern Philadelphia, there's no reason in this day and age that a dedicated staffer to serve the New York Icob Archives located in northeast Philadelphia could not, on the spot, pull that record, scan it, and mm -hmm. send it electronically to NARA in, uh, in this building and uh, we could have access to those records on the same basis, essentially, that we're getting them now. So um, I, I would uh, look forward to that type of system, one which would maintain things, potentially, just about as they are now. We will definitely have that capacity. Yeah. Did, did everybody hear? We will definitely have the capacity to scan on demand. We, are, we already do it for federal agencies. So it, it, we can implement that. Uh, immediately. I think scanning and digitization are critical. <clears throat> Just having come back <clears throat> from Salt Lake City, you're going to see what the Mormons have done out in the Family History Library out there. Uh, they have many, many records scanned now, and you can sit at their computer and you're looking at the microfilm, and for five cents you get a copy. They also have a new scanning device that when you put a film up, it can darken it, it can lighten it, and you can get a copy on your flash drive, or you can get a copy for five cents from that copy machine, and it's a state of the art. And then you ought to look at what Harvard University is doing, because for publications, uh, they're scanning all of their publications and their archival material, and you can either look at it, or what you can do is order a book and pay $8, and in five minutes you got the whole book. Yeah, I think designing the brick and mortar is a great opportunity to look into the technology and build in the infrastructure to support these kinds of things, and we're definitely keeping that in mind. Um, I have a comment and a question. I'd like to add to the list of things which Gail mentioned, the um, 
census indexes for all the states on microfilm. I think that's very important. It's where sometimes ancestry leaves us in the dark. Um, my comment is, uh, my question is, will there be a way to request online off-site material? Yes, and, and part of what our mission, and it's Dorothy's mission, is to educate that contact us first so that we can make sure what you have. So even if you're only in the city for one day, we will have what you need the day you're here. So we're definitely gonna educate people to let them know everything isn't on site and to contact us via email, phone call, give us, you know, and then we will follow up with you to make sure we can provide access. Yeah, and I would just add to that that, um, you know, we realize that a lot of our processes will be changing once we move down here, and these are things that we're investigating and figuring out how it will work best. So um, we definitely appreciate your comment. Uh, yes, my name is Andrea Ramsey. And I was wondering, will textural materials be available, say, on the Saturday that you're open, or will you be open on a Saturday? Because I know now they're only available during the week. Our plan is to be open on Saturdays. Um, regarding access to textual, we haven't ironed all that out, but that's definitely on the table. Um, it is, it's my understanding that the photographs that I, that the archive, the DNY archive has been scanning is going to be off-site, and I just wanted to verify that um, they would be available to be brought back upon our request, like a box at a time, as we've been doing, you know, we have a box for a few visits to scan it, and then when we're done, at, at the end of that day, we can request for the next week, and we'll be able to have more here. Okay, I just wanted to verify that. And, and the, the project they're doing is a great example of you know, the Brooklyn Navy Yard photos, it, it, they know in advance they want to look at so many boxes, we can make sure they're available on site. And we currently do that for records off site. We had a, six attorneys and their paralegals looking at this very large court case that was off site. We coordinated with them to make sure what they needed was available. And before they got to the end of the big run of boxes, we ordered the next run. And so for them, it was seamless because they were able to see everything they needed to see. So we would do the same thing with any ongoing or long term project. Um, you said the conversations about the move had been going on for five years and the customers are being involved in the last 18 months. Now the professionals are going to show up at the very first opportunity and they're going to be very clear about what they want. But I have a concern about the others, the general users, the hobbyists, uh, the people who are beginning to get interested. And I would encourage you to survey uh, local genealogical and historical societies in this region who in turn could survey their members about what they use most frequently and what their major concerns are about accessibility at your facilities. Anybody else? Nothing I forgot. <laughs> Again, looking at Salt Lake City and also NARA when I worked there, we used to have a welcome beginner's workshop. And if you go to the Family History Library, if you're a beginner, they, ha they automatically do a getting started workshop. You wear a badge that day that you're a beginner so that the staff know that so they can handle you better. But when I worked in NARA, we also had a room uh, that we used to give getting started lectures to people so they understand how to use the records and where they are and what's not there and also how to use the finding aids because I think that's very critical, how to use the finding aids. Diana, I just want to respond to that, and that's a great comment, Art. Um, we do do beginner workshops for groups on request, but we haven't been able to justify the staffing for the trickle of people that come in on a, a daily basis or even a weekly basis. It's just, we just don't have the audience, and that's where we've been relying on our volunteers. But it's a great comment, and once we are down here, we do expect to have that hands-on training um, not only because we'll have dedicated space, but we'll have extra public access computers so people can follow along with us when we are referencing subscription services like Ancestry and Footnote and so on. I, I just wanted to add as well, um, like Ellis Island, this facility will be a gateway. And with the, the new location, with the other facilities, you're going to get a lot of spontaneous people walking in. 
the nightmare scenario is that these people walk in, they, they learn something about the facility, want a document, and then, oh, you'll have to come back tomorrow. But I'm only in town for a day. So many of us, the professionals, whoever, while waiting for documents at other facilities, we've experienced that. And we've, you know, I'll give an example. Um, at um, uh, Municipal Archives, someone walks in and I said, oh, we have, we have um, Marilyn Monroe's uh, will right upstairs on the fourth floor. You can walk in and take a look at it. These people, if you're going to cultivate a new audience and make this facility grow and thrive, you've got to not just think of, you know, what are the, the big ticket items that people are going to come in for, but things that, that are a little offbeat. You know, I was amazed that the, the, the whole Bermuda Triangle investigation was there. These things that I did not know existed until I went through the inventory. I, I realized it's on the net. I'm a hard copy kind of guy. I had to go into your textual research room, sign for something, couldn't, I had to surrender my pen and all that, just to leaf through, you know, your potential inventory of what stays and what goes. It's got to be, you've got to reach out and, and make this less intimidating for those who are not as devoted professionally or scholarly or whatever, if this facility is to grow and thrive. And uh, I'll just add to that quickly, uh, Jordan, we have been meeting with the Smithsonian and the Ellis folk to talk about their numbers and how the flow of traffic goes. We are well aware and we are concerned about meeting that new audience. So those are things we are discussing. So I, I'd like to say just a little bit more about our preliminary list. And some of the staff have already talked about the list and, and how we get to, to where we are today. Um, you first heard that our staff prepared the preliminary list based upon their experience working with the researchers. We then had a conversation with our volunteers, and we invited our volunteers <coughs> in to come in and to look at the list and to provide feedback. We then wrote to those customers who currently visit us at least twice a month. So they each got a letter telling them that the preliminary lists were available and asking them the next time you're in, please take some time and take a look. We recognize that that's not the most convenient for everyone. Um, and we do plan to post these to our website and we had come up with a date of June 1st. And the reason that we came up with the date of June 1st is because these lists truly are preliminary. We need to process the information we get from our volunteers. We need to process the information we get from those customers who come to research on a regular basis. After we process that information, we need to process the information we receive today. That will all inform our new and updated preliminary list that then will be posted, and again, the plan was on June 1st. We hesitated to share it electronically because we all know how misinformation gets out there. I can't tell you how many calls I have received or communications I have received saying the National Archives is closing. We're not closing. We're moving two miles down the street. So that's just a little bit more about the list. And again, we can't emphasize enough that they are preliminary lists. Who's next? Uh, Diane, yes. also just uh, Jay, right? Jordan. Uh, Jordan, sorry. <laughs> Had mentioned about uh, having what we consider, quote, treasure records available. Uh, that, is, that was taken into account on the list. Yes. The expectation is as we, that we have a group of records now we call treasures that have high public intrinsic value or public interest. Those will be uh, moving to uh, the new location, and as we find additional materials, as you just discussed, those will be added to that group of records. And we will be displaying some originals so people can come up and just see what we have. Me again, sorry about this. Uh, I am not a computer person. I have a computer in the home, I stay away from it. I'll go to the library. I'm terrified of shutting down a system. I've done it, so I don't want to do it again. Anyway, but. I have found mistakes on answers. 
And I don't have a clue when I find the mistake. I come into the archives. I said, all right, I have to do this the hard way. I need the microfilm. And I do it. It's there for me to do. And I find, I see, all right, now I see what Ancestry did. How do you correct Ancestry? I'm just a regular, I'm not a professional. I'm just me. I've done over 50 families. I've done extended families as myself. I have one that, uh, a friend of mine, I got him all the way back to Charlemagne. I mean, I have done that. I'm interested in the research. How do you correct a giant like Ancestry and tell him, hey, you messed up here, what do you do? Well, we do talk to Ancestry um, if staff notice problems. So if you find things, you really should let staff know. Just let the person at the front desk know if, if you're there or send us an email. Because we can, oh, I'm sorry, we can write it. Uh, but if you contact us, they want to digitize more of our stuff. So I can tell the gentleman who's coming to me saying, I want to digitize this. And I'd say, that's wonderful. But you know how you could really help me is update this index that we're getting feedback from our users is not the best. So we're in a position to, to help correct. And they want to do it correctly, because they want you to be happy. So you continue to subscribe. So it's in their best interest to do this. So we can act as kind of this bridge. So feel free at any time. That I can't speak to. That would, I would have to talk to them about their process and how they do that. But we could find out. Uh, I'm Mary Cameron again. And I'll give you an example of what currently we've done. We had a speaker come up to Cus Cup Library who spoke about customs and treasures. And uh, my husband had a grand uncle who uh, worked for the customs. I was able to go to the National Archives because suddenly I was aware those records existed. And they put me in the room with the, the whole thing and gloves and everything, but they brought me the books and I was able to trace his work experience from 1918, his salary, his position names, uh, his increases during the Depression, his decrease in salary because there must have been a general decrease with everyone, all the way until 1948, at, at which time he died. And those records were invaluable. Um, to the world, I don't know. For me, they were invaluable. Uh, so I hope records like that will be available. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to know if there will be an increase or decrease of the staff. Nancy asked me that all the time. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it's a good question. We, we do have a proposal in to make sure that we have sufficient staff uh, to respond to what we expect the traffic will be in this new facility. Um, the, the, the federal process uh, requires that we go through the, the usual budget request process, but we, we are working on that. And, and I know that some of you have expressed to me personally um, your deep appreciation for many of our current staff members, and the heads are nodding, and a concern about whether, because some records might be going off-site, if our New York staff were in jeopardy of losing their job. And the answer to that question is no. Um, no New York staff members will be losing their positions. They are all uh, coming uh, with us to the Customs House, unless, of course, they choose to retire, um, and that we have no control over. Um, who else? I, I was waiting. <laughs> Roger. I also, real quick, um, the lovely Elizabeth in the back was specifically hired to be in New York until we move, and she's going to Philadelphia with her record. So uh, she was a new hire. So that's an example of thinking about, so Elizabeth's going, to, but she knew that before she joined us. I think it's very clear here that, um, well, one thing that's maybe not clear, but I think it shouldn't be necessary that the archives has to, the regions such as this have to justify their existence by the numbers of users and patrons coming in and so forth. Uh, they should exist regardless of that. However, and I think Leslie said this, that we have long had, and many other people have said they've long had a wonderful relationship 
using and coming to the archives and enjoying its, its records and dealing with staff and other researchers and so forth. So we would all want, as Estelle said, New York to be the best that it can be. And I think in terms of that with what you would hope would be new patrons as a result of the location because of easier access, the connection with Ellis Island, I'm not saying anything new here. And perhaps because you haven't really been able to crunch the numbers and determine you know, from the, in, the new wave of interest that we think is coming from Faces of America and who do you think you are. The latter of which, if you don't know, has been renewed for two more seasons. <coughs> and we hope will continue to generate some interest, even though they've got a lot of problems with that the way they present uh, what people do when they're researching family history or even something related in other types of records, whether it's torpedoes in the Bermuda Triangle, I'm not sure what, what that's all about. But what, what I see as a concern, um, and I, I see this in other facilities as well, and I've certainly spoken to Dorothy and to other people about that they're well aware of it, but I think if, if we're allowed, as I'm hearing, to become part of the solution, rather than just those pesky uh, researchers, that this is where we can really help. I think as Jordan said, someone, and another person said, someone coming in, say, from the Ellis Island boat, or they get wind of this through who do you think you are, which needs more exposure of, of, of archives connections, they can easily be frustrated. Uh, busy staff person, there's other things going on, say, oh, we have Ancestry over there on the computers. And the person goes over and they, try to find John Smith and they get frustrated in 10 minutes and there isn't a volunteer available. Uh, I'm just giving worst case scenario. One of the things that I see for the archives is very important is that you try and be as much of one stop shopping as possible. I know that is not possible. Uh, there are other facilities for all the other things that people would use for tracing whatever their subject matter is, whether it's family history or something else. But many of the materials that are slated to go into storage or to be donated are complementary to what is online. And I think that can't be stressed enough. There's a lot of attitude out there these days, and I'm sure many in the room have had many experiences in other types of facilities. It's online, that's the future, that's where it is, and we don't need the backup anymore. No one comes in the library to get Withering Heights anymore because they can get it for their ebooks or whatever, so we can get rid of that book. Um, those of us who have had long experience with research know what these backup situations are. If you can't find something online and you walk away when there is something else that might find that record that you can't find online, and if the archives has it right then and there, or the person can be persuaded to come back the next day when you can pull it in from North Philly or whatever. Uh, I, I think that's a very important point that you want to capture because we want to see the next generation of what we do be as good as we are and better and to come away with a, a wonderful, uh, good feeling about the archives. They found it here, they got good help, they're going to come back, they're going to become a regular, they're going to become a volunteer. Eventually down the line, they may be even giving classes, you know, uh, lecturing to help future generations. Who else? I just have one very simple direct question. Are you keeping the naturalization? Eastern, Southern, and Western. That's it. Yes. Thank you. And now, well. now I'm happy and I can go home. Okay. Jennifer Nelson. Um, I've worked at the archives now for about 19 years, and through the various functions of the life cycle, I can tell you, and including working with our, our website, um, it's a common experience throughout all of our locations in NARA and the presidential libraries as well, that 
a natural part of the exploration process where someone comes in and whether they have very clear expectations of what they want to see or they're just exploring, that a, a good portion of the time they don't actually get the specific thing that they were hoping to get because maybe they're looking for a needle in a haystack or maybe they don't have enough time or maybe they need some more information. But what we do hear back regularly from our visitors is that even if they don't find exactly the thing they're looking for, they find something else that was unexpected, that, that does exactly what, what we've been talking about here, keeps them engaged, keeps them coming back. So I just wanted to assure you that our, our staff, our expert staff, work very hard to identify records, to get to know people's needs, and to show them something that they will value. So I wanted to just offer that comment. A comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, I know it's not the time to get into specifics about individual types of records, um, but I'd like to use this as an example that might um, go beyond the particular record, um, and that's the World War II draft cards. Um, as those of us know who've worked with them, there are attachments. Ancestry did not scan the attachments, so if someone's looking, online, they do not get something that could be hugely valuable to them. Um, and that's something I want to mention as mm -hmm. to, to bear in mind of what records you decide to take and which ones you don't. Um, the question is about certifications. Could you please tell us something about the process of how certification, cert certification, I'm a professional, um, <laughs> how doing certifications of documents will take place. We will continue to certify documents and, and um, regardless of their location because the certification is just the process that a National Archives employee is certifying this is an accurate copy of be it the textual record or the microfilm. So whether the record is stored off-site or on-site, we can continue to certify. If it's a rush and it's off-site, we have a couple options. One of them is the digitizing on demand. We could have that sent to us electronically. We print it out in New York. We put a certified seal on it, and boom, you've got your certified copy. So we, that is absolutely an option. If you need an entire court case certified, well, that was going to take a little time anyway because we have to photocopy all the pages. But that, again, is something that we can offer. So regardless of where it's located, and that's the process we're going through right now talking to Philadelphia is, is how we're going to provide this. If We get a lot of certified certification requests that people don't come in. So they don't care where the record is and who certifies it as long as they get via mail their certified copy. So there might be a situation that directly from Philadelphia, the certification is sent to them in Florida. Um, I want to thank Diane for inviting me to come today. I thought now would be a good moment for me to tell you just a little bit about Philadelphia and how we feel about this partnership with New York. I know many of you as New Yorkers, because I've li I lived here for six years, I understand your energy, I love your passion, feel passionately about New York institutions. But in Philadelphia, we feel passionately about New York <laughs> institutions too. I just want to let you know. And why is that? Uh, we see ourselves as part of a network of partners. We work with the Atlanta office, we work with St. Louis, we work with Fort Worth, we work with everyone in the system. And we work in a way to try to make all of us better and stronger. And so we're really committed to making service delivery to you guys work for the, our Northeast Regional colleagues. That's just our commitment. I came to the National Archives because it is a network. It's a network of partners who, with their capacities together, can make the National Archives truly an institution that serves communities across the United States in a very deep so I want you to hear directly from me that our commitment is to make service delivery work. We want it to be not only as good as it is today, but even better, and we're committed to that. Um, I know uh, Philadelphia may seem like it's far away, but it's my commute to New York today was shorter than Dorothy's commute from her home on Long Island, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we are very, very close. And as I mentioned earlier, I still have ties with the New York State Archives, supporting their efforts to make history assets in New York stronger and better for the citizens of New York. 
and we can do that as well through our National Archives Partnership with our colleagues here in the Northeast. And so if you do encounter problems with service delivery in our new setup, whatever it turns out to be, Dorothy will, and Nancy will be working directly with my people in Philadelphia to make it better. We serve a lot of people in Philadelphia. Our textual records numbers are stable. We serviced over a thousand kids in a special history program this year. We do tons and tons of um, public programming, and we're one of the smallest National Archives organizations, but we do everything we do through partnerships, and it's our partners who make us stronger and make the community stronger, and so we're committed to this partnership to keep New York a strong place and maybe even help it be a better place, so I just wanted you to know. Thank you, Vicki. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Philadelphia. Um, I, uh, last week I found a, uh, a Maryland naturalization record on footnote. I ordered it electronically from NARA in Philadelphia and was astonished to receive it in the mail three days later. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, okay. You know, I want to talk um, just for a minute about um, our efforts to process records at the National Archives which have truly been a focus for us for the last couple of years. Um, nationwide, not just in New York, the National Archives staff across the country has been working to uh, identify and process all of our original records to a certain level, a level that will allow us to do so much more to promote to the world what it is that we have our resources. I've heard several of you say, either to me personally or some here today, I looked at the list. I didn't know you had that. Roger has pointed out on several occasions, well, nobody's using your materials because they don't know what you have. Um, we have heard you. We heard you even before this process. Um, so what, again, what that will allow us to do, our goal is to have any records that are ultimately identified to go off site will be processed to a certain level. So again, they'll be defined and they will be easy for us to get back whenever our researchers need them. Any last questions? Diane, can I? Any, there you go. Get up again. Um, I wanted to, I have a couple of closing comments. Um, by the way, good timing, Mike. Good lunch time. Uh, a couple of closing comments. One, uh, a, a, as you can probably guess, uh, our new archivist, David Ferriero, who of course used to uh, be the head of the New York Public Library for at least part of it, um, is a uh, big proponent of uh, using new technology. And that's a kind of a, a theme that came up several times today. You will be seeing greater use of technology, both internet and equipment in research rooms um, and other, quote, social media tools uh, during the next several years. And that reminds me of when you were talking about posting the list on the web, um, the, the list of records that we're gonna move to uh, to the, the, the customs house, and I might add where the other records are going to be so everybody knows where they are. One of the tools we might consider using is the social media tool known as idea sharing or ideal scale, idea factory. It goes by different names, but it basically allows people to quote, vote, you know, make comments and then other internet access uh, users to vote on those comments. Um, it's something we're using internally in the National Archives, and one of our external programs is using it now. Um, we could try and set that up for this group. It, it just gives us a better tool for individuals to make comments and for others to see what those comments are and to literally informally vote on them, um, which will be good feedback for us. Um, other thing I wanted to comment on is you know, you've been talking about some of the resources that are available from the National Archives here at the National Archives in New York City. 
Philadelphia. Um, the, the National Archives network around the country, especially because there's a large genealogy uh, contingent here today, let me just give you a flavor of some of the new series of records that we have either accessioned in the last couple of years or about to accession. So all of the mili modern military personnel files dating back to the kind of 1890s um, have been accessioned or are being accessioned um, at the National Archives in St. Louis. Um, sometime in the next couple of weeks or months, we're going to accession the uh, files of the Railroad Retirement Board, uh, the, which are now available from RRB on their website. We will be taking over um, the access to those files. Um, we are now in the process of slowly but surely accessioning what are known as alien case files um, from the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, formerly INS. Uh, we accession them 100 years after the date of birth of the individual subject to the file. And in each of the, the last two cases, uh, the, I, the USCIS files and the Railroad Retirement Board files, we are getting name indexes to the files so that we can post them on the web and make it easier for people to find them, either order them online or let us know they want to come and use them or get a digital copy of them. Um, we're sometime, well, we already also started accessioning out in St. Louis civilian personnel files from the federal government, again, dating back to the 1880s, I think. Um, in the case of some of the older personnel files of the federal government, we are ourselves in the process working with volunteers to create indexes to those, name indexes to those files. It's a long, arduous process, but we're working on it. I, I also wanted to comment that um, ancestry, our relationship with Ancestry, Footnote, um, um, the, uh, what's the acronym for the Latter-day Saints? Oh, yeah. LD. GSU. GSU, thank you. Genealogical Society of Utah. Uh, we, we have formal, we the National Archives, has, have formal national uh, memorandum of agreement with those entities. So when Nancy was talking about, we are a major partner with those entities, and we can influence, uh, to, to some extent, um, what they do, how they do it, and how they make it available. And we have regular meetings with them to talk about it. Also, if you don't know, part of our agreement includes that five years after they have digitized and collected metadata on records that are in the custody of the National Archives, those images and the metadata become available through the National Archives. So we're already like, you know, at the three plus year mark for some of the records. Um, and believe me, we are, we the National Archives are working furiously to make sure <laughs> that we have the storage and access devices um, to make those digital images available. So there, there's an enormous amount of uh, work going on at the National Archives to make every one of our locations around the country, whether it's in Washington, D.C., New York City, or any of the 13 regional archives locations around the country to make all of the resources of the National Archives as readily available as possible. So the quote model we're talking about here in New York City where it feels like some of our records are stored off site, well, from my kind of global perspective, what we're really trying to do is make sure if you come to the New York City location of the National Archives, that you have better access to all of the resources of the National Archives. That's ultimately where we're going. That's what we want to accomplish. So I'd rather us think big. I don't want to discourage you. Clearly, if you want things closer by, let us know what you think the priorities are. But my commitment to you, on behalf of the Archivist of the United States and my colleagues, is our vision is to make sure you have available 
hopefully at your fingertips, as close as possible to, to that vision, all of the resources of the National Archives. We're not going to get there tomorrow, but that's where we're headed. That's what we want to accomplish. And in the big scheme of things, that's where we really need your feedback, your input, and your support uh, to make happen. Again, I uh, thank you, staff, um, all the staff here, Diane, me. <laughs> And we thank you for coming today and for, continu for your continuing support and continuing to work with us um, as we try to implement this new vision for the National Archives. Keep in touch. We'll, we'll be following up, as I said, making sure the information that came up today is posted on our website along with whatever explanation we need to provide to answer your questions. And we will certainly follow up with regard to the lists of records um, that have been so far narrowly distributed, we will broaden uh, that approach. So, thank you again. Let us know if you have any other questions. We're always available. Can we see a quick show of hands? Who would like the tour? Okay. <laughs>